Let's finish up this uh, warm-up of the argument that shows that in Rn, any closed form is exact. What we have so far is that we've taken alpha and one form on R3, we've smushed it and restretched it to become a simpler form Zz, Cz alpha, and that's going to be exact as long as alpha is closed. Okay. So what we're going to do is going to look at the difference between those, or essentially say alpha is Cz alpha is going to be that plus an exact form. So since this is d of something, it's dc beta, namely, and this is d of something, then the whole thing is going to be exact. So the sum of two exact forms is exact. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to take alpha, we're going to do an operator involving integration on it, and the d of that is not going to be alpha again, but it's going to be the difference between alpha and its smushed version. And that's going to be enough, because the smushed version was exact by induction, and then this part is going to be exact by an ex uh, explicit calculation. So here's the definition. We take alpha, and remember the CZ part was con concentrating on the P and Q, the X and Y part. So it makes sense that K alpha is only going to actually depend on the R part, that was the Z component of alpha, the D in front of the DZ. And it also makes sense that it's an integral, because that's going to have to come in somewhere in terms of doing an antiderivative process. So it's just the integral of R from 0 to Z. And this should look familiar from that vector calculus calculation. It's this kind of of integral that we were doing there, and this is really a generalization of that, that proof. Okay, now notice here k alpha is a function. Um, this dt is not a, one, a usual one form dt. That dt is matched with the integral, and so this whole thing is just a function of x and y. Um, it's a oh, function of, sorry, x, y, and z. x, y, and z. It's, it's the z dependences up here. Okay, so here's the, here's the task, and if you want to pause the video, this is a good time. The, the task is to show this equation. Alpha is CZ alpha plus DK alpha. And some hints, ordinary FTC, passing a partial derivative and a different variable through an integral sign, and definitely need to use it that alpha is closed. And I wrote that out very explicitly here. If D alpha equals zero, it amounts to just these equalities of partial derivatives. Okay, so I'm gonna go for it if you're ready. What we're gonna do is we're just gonna calculate DK alpha, and we're gonna show that it's equal to alpha minus CZ alpha. Okay. So dk alpha is d of this thing, whoops, okay, and we have a definition of d. This is a function of x, y, and z. We know what the definition of d is. It's just partial uh, with respect to x of this thing, and then all of that put that in parentheses times dx plus, and now I'm just going to copy and paste. This is just d of a function implementing the gradient. Well, let's not put that all on one line. So here's dy, and then that's times dy, and then there's dz, and this times dz. Now remember, this dt is matched with the integral. These dx's are really the basis one forms. Okay, let's see what we can do with things like FTC and passing um, for derivatives through integrals. Here, d by dx passes through, because this is an integral and that only has to do with z, and it passes through into this variable. And so we're going to get the integral still of um, d by dx of r of t dc. OK, that's good. Similarly, d by dy is going to pass into here. And so that's going to be very similar to this. And I'm just going to change that to a y. Okay, and then plus, ah, now this is where the fundamental theorem applies, because now the dependence in z is actually in the integral. Derivative of an integral is just the function itself, r of x, y, and you have to evaluate at z. Oops, don't need that. Okay, now this is a really, really good thing to see, because remember alpha had an r of x, y, z in it. Cz alpha killed that. It didn't have the r in it. Um, Cz alpha was just... Um, ooh, I don't know if I actually have ZZ alpha. Well, well, we'll write that in a minute. But it's not going to have an R in it, so it's good to see this coming out. Okay. So now what do I do with this? Ah, dr dx. Hey, that's something I know. And I can turn it into a Z derivative. And I love to see Z derivatives inside integrals that are talking about this integrating in the Z variable uh, because I'm going to use the fundamental theorem. Okay, so this is going to be the integral. Well, let's just copy them both maybe. So this is going to be minus, oh no, not minus, sorry. Just equal this, the same thing. d by dz of, dp of p of x, y, t. And this is going to be d by dz 
So d by d, dr dy uh, was d q dz. Okay. And then plus r of x, y, z. Okay. So now I can use the fundamental theorem. That's going to be p of x, y, z minus, so this is the version where you're integrating a derivative and you need to look at it at both endpoints, x, y, 0 plus q of x, y, z minus q, shift q, oh, I had caps lock on, x, y, 0 plus r of x, y, z. Oh, and I've just completely lost the dx's and stuff. I'm very sorry. If you're wondering where those went, I just forgot them. These guys are not all added together in terms of like scalars or something. These are components of a form. And then this has a dz. That makes so much more sense. Okay. And so this guy is still times a dx. And this guy, they say it's more endearing when the video maker makes mistakes. So I hope that's true here. And then this is times a dz. Okay. So all of this stuff is times dx. All of this stuff is times dy. And then this, uh, this is screwed up. This is times dz. OK. Well, look at what we've got. p of x, y, z, dx, q of x, y, z, dy, r of x, y, z, dz. That's alpha minus, and then the rest of it is, didn't mean to do a control p there, p of x, y, 0, dx and then minus q of x, y, 0, dy. Well, that's exactly what you get if you take p, q, p, dx plus q, dy plus r, dz. You set the, uh, these two to be 0 and make it a form in r2, and then you just bring it back up into r3. That is exactly c, z, alpha. And so indeed, alpha minus c, z, alpha is the same as dk. And we definitely use the closeness of the form. We definitely use these equations, or at least two of them. Um, and we used two versions of the fundamental theorem and passing derivatives through integrals as advertised. So that's the warm up uh, for the general case. That was go for a one form going from R2 to R3. Now, the only thing that's different about the general case is simply the bookkeeping. We have to go back to the world where we have j1 through jp and x1 through xn plus 1. But it's really, if you just, if you really understood the previous example, it's really going to be um, the same thing. So we've got a general p form in rn plus 1. And p is going to be greater than 0. So it's not just a function, because this, this just isn't true for p equals 0. But we know it's kind of silly for p equals 0. And we're going to assume that we've already proved that all closed p forms in one dimension down, rn, are exact. And we want to show the same thing is true for p forms in Rn plus 1. So um, we're going to take a p form alpha in Rn plus 1, and we're going to have this z operator. And what is it going to do? It's going to take, um, if you have a function of those n plus 1 variables, times a basis 1 form with certain uh, x's, j1 through jp. If it doesn't include that last variable, so that's the analog of not having a dz in it before, then I'm just going to kill it. Oh, sorry, if it does include it, I'm going to kill it. So that was the analog. Right, let me go up here, scroll up a little bit. That's the analog of the z here. It killed the dz part and left the dx and dy alone. OK, so let's go back to, OK. If you do have a dz or a, a dxn plus 1, the last coordinate is going to die. If not, all it's going to do is it's going to set the last coordinate to be 0 and leave the rest alone. Now, a form, any, an arbitrary uh, p form is not just of this form. It's going to be a sum of these guys with different choices of the, the j1 through jp, but we're just going to require, just require z to be linear. Okay. So what we're really doing is we're just taking alpha and we're restricting it to the subset x n plus 1 equals 0. That's a, that's a copy of rn inside of rn plus 1. Okay. So we're going to show in a minute that dz is equal to z. To the, they commute. Okay. Um, let me just go ahead and define all the operators, and then we'll start working on it. The C operator, really, really similar. It just uh, it just extends the a form to be constant. So if, if you have beta on Rn, let's say it's of the form f of the n variables times some dx's. Well, I need to I need to extend that to n plus one. So what I need to do is be a little careful about the notation. 
that form evaluated at some particular x1 through xn plus 1, you just take f of x1 through xn, in other words, you don't make it depend on xn plus 1, the new variable, and then just times the same dx's. So this is a slightly less tautological than it appears, because what you're getting here, what you started out with was something that's a form on Rn, and you end up with something with exactly the same formula, but it's a form on Rn plus 1. It just doesn't happen to depend on the n plus 1 variable, and it doesn't have, it never will have an x, a dx of n plus 1. Very, very similar to the R2 to R3 case. And we just extend it by linearity, so if it's a sum of these guys, you just do the sum. Okay. So we just, it, the way to say that is extends beta to be constant in the xn plus 1 variable. We'll be able to very easily show that that commutes with the d operator. And so very, very similarly, what we're going to get is that if alpha is closed, then by our inductive hypothesis, Cz alpha is exact. And that's, this is more substantial in this case, because we're going to have sort of most of the information of alpha is encoded in Cz alpha. It's just only that one last variable that's been kind of destroyed. So that's the, ro the, the role of k. k, we take something of the form f times a wedge of dx's. And here, if the last variable doesn't, isn't equal to n plus 1, if it doesn't involve a dz, we ignore it, we kill it. It's the ones where it does have a dx n plus 1, the analog of DC, dz before, that's the interesting ones. We're going to produce a form that's one degree lower, a p minus 1 form, by taking the dxj1 through dxjp, just killing off the last dx, so it's going to be all the other ones, and then taking the integral from 0 to whatever the value of the coordinate is, that last coordinate is, of f with a variable put in for the last thing. Okay, So that looks a little more complicated, but it really is the generalization of this guy. This took a one form, which had dx, dy, and dz, it took the thing that was in front of dz, namely r, stripped off the dz, and just gave to, took the coefficient and then integrated it from 0 to z and dt. That's the same thing here. We're taking the dxj1 through dxjp, stripping off the dxjp, leaving the rest of them intact. That's a little bit more complicated than before, because it might be a, a p form with p greater than 1. And then making the coefficient this, uh, this integral of the coefficient, you had, coefficient function you had before. And the claim is that if alpha is closed, then alpha is cz alpha plus dk alpha. And there's going to be one, more, one further twist, though, on how that works. OK, so now that I've kind of signposted all that, I think I'm going to wait for the next video to actually run through all the calculations. But you should probably be able to do at least the calculations um, involving just z, z and c, um, just in analogy from the, the previous stuff.